I come before you in the mind state of liberation, coming from a long legacy of battle stars and freedom fighters. I acknowledge my duty to truth and justice as a Soul Vibers Nation representative, and I am a humble servant of my community. Elders, may I have permission to proceed? Thank you. Let's give Ancestors Roots another round of applause. Thank you for getting this ancestral energy up from within our spirits. How do Africans feel? How do Africans feel? I don't feel you right now. We're going to try that again. How do Africans feel? A lot better, a lot better. <clears throat> we want to again welcome you and thank you for participating in our second annual Unify or Die conference. Let's give yourself a round of applause for attending because you could be doing anything else today, but you chose to come here with the Soul Vibers Nation for this Unify or Die conference where we are working to make Harambe a reality, pulling together through practical work. In fact, an example of the practical work, earlier today, we had a zero murder rate movement presentation of our plan on how we will work together with the community to bring the murder rate down to zero. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Show of hands, show of hands, how many people were there today? Okay, good. Now the rest of you, you missed it but you will be able to see the DVD so you can study the plan and what we're talking about and determine how you will get involved. Not how you might get involved, but how you will get involved. Because the basic truth is that we all have to get involved with the solutions to the problems that we're facing today. Now, when we're talking about the murder problem, of course, we're talking about a symptom, a symptom that has a root to it. It's just an effect of a greater cause. We understand that our families have been broken down, not just through slavery, but really for the last 40 or so years since this integration situation we've been involved in. Because right after slavery, our families still had a lot of strong family values intact. You understand what I'm saying? We still had most of the households headed by black men and black women. But now, as statistics say, it's about what? 70% of black households run by single black mothers? That don't sound like collective work and responsibility. But there's a reason for that. There's a reason why there's not enough black men in the home. Okay? And Dr. Francis Cress Welsey, one of our elders, one of our sisters, one of our mamas, revolutionary and warriors, is going to go into what she's been going into for years. But we at Soul Vibers Nation, what we represent and what we do is the work of building a nation. But see, we are already a nation as a people. We don't really have to build a nation. We just have to come together and utilize the resources that we already have. Network, pull the resources to solve our problems. I want to ask y'all a series of questions right now. Because Sister Dr. Francis Cress Wilson talks about the areas of activity that through the system of white racism, slavery, and oppression, also known as white supremacy, they attack us from. Now war, war is one of the things. Now let me ask any of you in the audience by the raise of hand, and if you want to keep it private, fine, but I, just think about it. How many people here tonight have survival skills? Meaning you can go out into nature and survive. Good, good, please. I want to talk to all of y'all, okay? Because we actually are going to, have to begin strongly working together to train each other and, tra and train other men and women throughout our communities. We need to have everyone in every household with a minimum amount of survival skills in case anything happens. We can't be just ass out like in Hurricane Katrina's situation, okay, when people were suffering, just waiting for the government to come and rescue us. That's not acceptable, all right? So how many warriors in the audience tonight, on any level? Excellent. Now, I also want to ask you this. How many people 
are teachers here tonight. Teachers. That's another thing that we have to do. We have to begin. Well, let me ask you this. Out of all of you that raised your hand, how many of you believe that we have to have a proper education for our children and our people today? How many of you believe that we have to control our own educational process today? How many are you? How many of you are willing to work with one another to make this happen? Okay, we got a lot of hands raising, and it's just enough hands that raise today that shows and proves to me that by the year from now, the educational situation in our city should be a lot different. Would you agree? But it's going to take commitment. It's going to take resolve on our parts. We have to deal with all of these levels of life activity that we're being attacked from, the lies, the miseducation, and so forth. How many people like to eat? Excellent. I see some people didn't raise your hand. I need to talk to y'all. Maybe y'all living on light or something. You know, we, we can learn that. If you know some higher technology, please teach it. But how many of us understand how important health is? How many of us understand that we're being attacked through our health, through food, through water, and so forth? So let me ask now, how many healers are with us tonight? Ah, okay. We have some hands being raised. How many of us agree that we have to work together to heal our community, to be healthy? That it's our responsibility. Nobody's going to do it but us. How many of us are willing to learn, if you're not healers, to be healers? We have to get to the point where each and every household has at least one holistic health practitioner with a limited, well, not a limited, with a mandatory minimum amount of holistic health knowledge and science and enforces this throughout their household. And then we have to get to the point where we are training people within our communities, our own healers, to take care of ourselves. Because we are in a state of emergency. And we can't think that if we continue to go on like this, that we're going to survive. We're going to have to make some serious changes. And it's urgent. It's urgent. We, we can't be relaxed any longer. Be at peace. But don't sit down and relax like you're watching a Sunday night football game on a regular. I'm saying relax right now, but I'm saying in everyday life, we have to understand we're at war, and we got to respond appropriately. We have to teach and train our children to respond to the situation. They're never too young to learn the truth. If they're old enough to be taught lies, then they're old enough to learn the truth from the cradle. From the cradle. And this is what we have to commit to. How many midwives are in the audience? Midwives? Oh, we got a lot of training to do. Because that means, okay, good. That means that everyone in here is relying on going to the hospitals when we're giving birth to babies. But don't they experiment on us in hospitals? Aren't they injecting us with all types of craziness? Aren't they trying to force vaccines on the children in order to allow them to go to school? There's a lot of things going on. So we need people to start being trained to give birth to our own babies. We have to have vision now. Some of us may want to eventually build with a community that has children that may be a part of a community that is self-sufficient where they don't even know that them children exist. Why? Because the community is sustaining the children. But we have to now go get them a social security number, make them slaves to the system. How many of us understand about sovereignty? True sovereignty. We have to begin to teach that among our people. We have to become a sovereign people again. We have to deal with all these aspects of people activity. Any scientists here today? Inventors? Good. Well, you, you do everything, bro. Everybody, we, we got to talk. <laughs> it, I mean, we have to begin using and developing creative solutions to our problems. Let's stop chasing behind all the technology that they bring out and say that this thing you got to have now, this little cell phone which used to be as big as a suitcase is now as big as your fingertip, and now we got to go and we got to change with all the technology. Understand that they're enslaving us through this technology. We have to understand that our true technology, its foundation is within the black family. It's the family. That's the greatest technology that we brought to this world. And we have to get back to that and find better, more effective ways to live as a people. So we're going to bring on right now a sister who has been committed for a long, long time 
before I knew anything about black consciousness, before I knew anything about white supremacy. This sister has been teaching. She has a book out called The ISIS Papers, Keys to the Colors. And if you haven't, sister got it up right now. And if you don't got it, you got to get it. We have some available today. But don't just read it. Spread the word. Don't just spread the word. Organize. Okay, because we have scholars and people who dedicate their time and energy decoding the information, decoding the way that the white man has been enslaving our people. We got to take advantage of this. How can we take advantage of it if we're not organized? So it's that time. So if any of us, any of you have had dreams that you wanted to be a freedom fighter one day, that you want to invent solutions to the problem, you want to be a, a teacher, a leader, now is the time. Our ancestors are priding us, are pushing us. Come on, let's take this world back. We have no right to let fear stop us. Yeah, the fear is there, but we got to go through it. And we can love each other through this, brothers and sisters. So with no further ado, we want to bring on our scholar, our teacher, our doctor, our sister, our elder, and our mama, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. All right. Thank you very, very, very much. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, good evening, everyone. I am honored to have been invited to join you this evening to talk about ourselves as black people and to talk about the issues that we are facing. I decided to entitle my remarks, The Noose, the Swastika, and the Burning Cross. The Noose, the Swastika, and the Burning Cross. I have been talking about racism, white supremacy, for the last, I hate to say it, 37 years. And it has been interesting to me because many people, many of my colleagues in psychiatry have said racism was a part of the past. And black people do not have to talk about racism anymore. And why is that Dr. Francis Welsing continuing to beat on the drum about racism, white supremacy? So even though it is an evil and an injustice to see hanging nooses, I'm glad that they are appearing because it is an opportunity for us to get oriented. Do you see, those of us who were hoping that the problem had disappeared. Do you see, but if a problem is not solved, it continues to resurface. Do you see, so we are not only seeing Jenna, Louisiana, we are also seeing nooses being hung everywhere. And we are also seeing an individual who recently won the Nobel Prize, James Watson, do you see, of great scientific fame, come out and openly state that black people are genetically inferior in terms of intelligence compared to white people. And I'm happy about that. Do you see now, when he was confronted, he said he didn't know why those words came out of his mouth. 
I need to invite him to my office. <laughs> Because it wasn't long ago, although it's been decades ago, that I debated another Nobel Prize laureate, Dr. William Shockley, the person who won the Nobel Prize for inventing the transistor. And he was going around in the 1970s talking about black people were genetically inferior compared to white people. But I had written a paper that I presented in 1970 at the National Medical Association because then some of my colleagues were talking about racism. And I had written a paper talking about why do people who classify themselves as white have to demean and degrade black people's genetics. And that paper was entitled, The Crest Theory of Color Confrontation and Racism, White Supremacy. <laughs> and in that paper, I talked about the fact that when people who classify themselves as white keep saying something is wrong with black people's genetics, See, three of their fingers are pointing back at themselves. And I didn't invent any genetics. I just simply thought about the things that I had been taught in their institutions and in medical school. That the inability to produce skin pigmentation is defined not by Francis Welsing, but by their own scientists as a genetic recessive trait and a genetic deficiency, a genetic deficiency, and it is albinism, A-L-B-I-N-I-S-M, <laughs> albinism, meaning the cells in everybody's skin that are called melanocytes that are charged with the production of melanin pigment, the black pigment. If you have a lot of melanin, you're crystal black, a little bit less you look brown, a little bit less you look red, a little bit less you look yellow, and white is almost none at all. Now they had defined albinism as a genetic deficiency state when they were talking about mice and rats <laughs> and other forms of life. They never thought that some black person would come along and say, if the majority of the people on the planet have pigmented skins, then as far as human beings are concerned, white skin is albinism. Do you follow what I'm saying? See, in other words, they were busy saying something is wrong with you, when in reality there was something wrong with them. And I explained that this is the reason that they suntan. You see, trying to create color. And I'm updating it and saying now that this is the reason that so many of them are trying to cover their bodies with tattoos. See, now we need to think about that because sometimes monkey see, monkey do. And we don't understand why. See, it's like they do something, we think we have to do something. It's some black people who think that they have to get in the sun and tan too. <laughs> see, but we have been blessed by the creator with color. And indeed, and in fact, the Creator made us the chosen people in that we are the mothers and fathers of everybody on this planet. You see, and as the original people, we were crystal black people. The color that we have been taught to hate 
under racism, white supremacy. Do you see, but this not only explained the sun tanning and maybe now the tattooing, but I said this is the core of racism and this is why racism contains within it, it's dynamic, the need to destroy black people in general, but black men in particular. You see, and we are seeing that with the high level of incarceration of black men, with the dropping out of school, and the high levels of unemployment. And that goes back to the fact that black men are perceived as the persons who can cause white genetic annihilation. Now as a female, women, we have ovaries and in our ovaries we have the genetic material. But women cannot impose and force sexual intercourse. Shall I say that again? <laughs> See, females, we can try to entice and influence, but if a female, if I reached in my purse and pulled out an Uzi, and I started to threaten a man and say, I don't care if your wife is here, you are gonna have sexual intercourse, and I frightened him, he wouldn't be able to. <laughs> See, because the erection disappears in the presence of fear. So women cannot impose sexual intercourse. And so the white collective from the time that Christopher Columbus came out of Spain in his little boats and started the white people circumnavigating the globe, they began to realize, wait a minute, all these other people on the planet are people of color. And the men, just like the fondling fathers, did you hear the term? <laughs> See, black people, we don't need to say founding fathers. We need to talk about the fondling fathers, the Thomas Jeffersons, the George Washingtons, and all of those slaveholders who were raping and taking sexual advantage of black women. They found out that by sexually relating, their white color would disappear. And they began to understand, wait a minute, when they realized that they were just a tiny, tiny minority population on the planet. And see, we're still busy calling ourselves minorities. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen? They are the minority on the planet, but they know the value of saying repeatedly to other people that they are the minorities because it makes them feel weak and it makes them feel vulnerable. So we really need to start talking about the global white minority. The global white minority. The global white minority. See, and the global white minority realized that for them to genetically survive on planet Earth, they have to have control over all of the non-white people. And because black people have the greatest genetic potential to cause white genetic annihilation, the heaviest pressure has to be on us as a people, as a total people, and as black men in particular. And so therefore, we learned, many of us learned before we learned how to read or write. If you are black, get back. If you are brown, stick around. 
If you are yellow, you're mellow, and if you're white, you're all right. They were just color coding what they needed to do for white genetic survival. And that is continuing on the planet today. So I maintain that we need to update our understanding and understand the news like they're trying to tell us is just a joke and that it doesn't mean anything. I would suggest that for every person who hasn't already read the book without sanctuary, it's a pictorial essay of all the lynchings and castrations of black men and burning of black men as white people stood around and cheered. And in some cases taking home body parts. We need to look at that and study that. And I say don't waste any energy hating white people. That's not taking us anywhere. It's like if we sat down at a chess board to play chess at a tournament, you don't beat your opponent by hating your opponent. You have to take all of your energy and understand exactly the moves that the opponent is going to make and make certain that you know how to counter those moves. Now this is not a mystery to black people. Black people are expert playing basketball, playing football, playing baseball. All of these are psyching your opponent. What moves is the opponent going to make? And you make counter moves that can checkmate the opponent and move on to victory. So we need to understand and master Instead of trying to ignore racism and pretend that it doesn't exist or that it went away some time ago. No, racism is alive and well. Racism is a total global system that as Neely Fuller outlined in his textbook for victims of racism, textbook for victims of white supremacy, Racism operates in economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. Now I'm adding to that health because people are busy right now talking about health care disparities. But there are disparities in all of those areas of activity. There are disparities in economics and disparities in education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war, and health. And I say disparities in entertainment, why? When only certain kinds of images can be shown of black people where negative and demeaning and degrading and buffoon-like images are portrayed of black people, that is helping to maintain the system of racism, white supremacy. Or in entertainment, when the system of racism says, I know people like Public Enemy, they started out with giving a political message but when they put that political message on a beat, the system of racism said they can revolutionize the thinking of their people. So no, we have to pay them large sums of money and make some of them millionaires. But the price they will have to pay is calling themselves dogs and calling themselves gangsters and thugs, and calling women bitches and hoes, and bow wows, because they understand if you can get a people to demean and to degrade themselves, then you have beaten them. You have beaten them and you have defeated them.
So when people don't have an in-depth analysis of the problem, when they think or have been taught to think, oh, it's all about green power. It's just about money. A young woman told me she would eat feces if they paid her enough money. So it's not just about money. It's a total system, and the total system is about white genetic survival by any means necessary. White genetic survival by any and all means necessary. And so they understand in the area of employment, in the area of labor, if we incarcerate large numbers of black men, we are controlling the size of the black population. If we incarcerate large numbers of black men, we can control the sexuality of black women. If we incarcerate large numbers of black men, we can control the sexuality of black women. Do you see, and all we need to do is put on the TV that lesbianism is okay. Now don't misunderstand me. To a large extent, people are not really selecting which direction they go in. We are being pushed. Some of my colleagues in medicine have even been looking at why do we seem to have an epidemic in homosexuality. Now the CIA and the military, it came out in the newspaper that they were designing chemical weapons where they could spray, spray it on the enemy forces and the enemy soldiers would begin to want to have sex with each other and then they would be defeated. Now, if somebody is thinking to create such a chemical or chemicals, I say perhaps they have already deployed it. Do you understand what I'm saying? If they have chemicals and plastics that they understand are already affecting the sexuality of fish and frogs and causing fish and frogs to become castrated and the males to become effeminized. Why wouldn't they deploy it? It's just like I'm saying, anybody who thinks HIV AIDS is some accident that fell out of the sky, I say, wake up. See, wake up. My position is that it's biological warfare until proven otherwise. Until proven otherwise. And if we understand what the dilemma of the white minority population on planet Earth is, and their key survival dilemma is that they are overwhelmingly outnumbered by people of color. And because of their genetic recessive state, they can be genetically annihilated. So it makes sense to them it makes sense to them to do whatever damage or harm to the black population because we are the population that is most feared. There's a book that is called Breaking Rank. And again, I suggest everybody get that book. First, repeat after me. Reading. 
is more important than watching TV. Say it again. Reading is more important than watching TV. Do you see, because if you know how to read, there's all kinds of material in books and in newspapers. Like people used to say, if they don't want black people to see it, put it in a book. See, and all we have to do is go back into our history. When we were under formal enslavement, where if you were caught trying to read, they would beat you, if not kill you. Because with reading, you could get information. You can go in a bookstore, you can go in a library, you can go to a newsstand. See, I encourage, buy three or four newspapers every day and see what the newspapers are communicating to the people that are considered to be the important people. And it is not us. You see, no, train them and train their children to say if you are reading and studying, you're trying to act white. Do you all understand? Now this is, see, this is genocide. See, people who are fearful of their genetic annihilation will design genocide of the populations that they have fear of. So the book I was talking about, Breaking Rank, it's a book that is written by, was written by a white retired police officer from California. And right in his book, he talks about how the white police officers would attack the men that they considered to be the darkest and the men that were the largest. They would just go after them. And I guess everybody else in the middle, but he lays it out that this is what they were doing. So we need to read that. And that whole discussion about whether he's 14 or 40, I thought he had a weapon. Well, he does have a weapon. Do you see, but the weapon is his genitals, and his weapon is the powerful genetic material in his testicles. Now, some people don't want to think about this. I was at an art gallery earlier today, and a gentleman who's a teacher at a junior high school was telling me about an African proverb that says, if you can't face the disease, if you can't talk about the disease, it's impossible to have a cure. The disease is racism, white supremacy. Do you see? And if we can't talk about it, and if we can't think about it, and if we cannot strategize against it, we'll just always be on our knees crying and complaining and begging. And in my own mind, I can see the Creator, black. See, just like now the scientists, they've gone beyond black holes as the most powerful thing in the universe. And they're talking about black energy that is holding the whole cosmos together. <laughs> See, it's very interesting when they come up and talk about something powerful, the color black comes to their mind. See, even though they can't see the energy, they've called it black. 
It's just like when they talk about justice. They don't put white robes on the people. Has anybody walked in a court and seen the judge sitting up in a white robe? No. They put a black robe on the person, meaning that black people have the greatest understanding to know about justice. You see, if you are educated, now the, some of the graduation gowns are blue and red, but they used to be all black. And if we go back in our history and understand the very first universities on the planet were on the continent of Africa. Black people's universities, Timbuktu, Mali and the Europeans designed their universities based on what they learned from Africa. And so they just slipped up and started putting black gowns on themselves after they destroyed what was in Africa. Do you see, but we have to decide. See, if I could wave a magic wand Black people would put singing and dancing aside. We've already proven that we're the best and that we have mastered that. So we don't need any more shake booty. We really don't need any more singing. What we need is calm and quiet thinking and analysis. See, this is very important, and don't misunderstand me. I'm baptized Baptist, christened Methodist. Do you see? But there's a time and a place for singing. There's a time and a place for dancing and entertaining. But it's not in the middle of a war. It's not in the middle of a war when people are hanging nooses all around us. And the noose is not just some loop. It means kill black people. And this president and this administration, see this is why it is important to read the newspapers. In the newspaper in the New York Times back in June, it said, this administration and the Justice Department has decided that they are no longer going to focus on racism as a priority. They are just going to focus on religious discrimination and that the various states could take care of racism the way they wanted. So Louisiana stepped up. Do you understand? If there is no federal protection, which is what black people fought for for decades, and they decide, no, we're going to set that aside. Well, that just said, do to black people what you want to do to black people. We're not going to bother you. So the nooses showed up not only on jobs, not only in Jenna, Louisiana, but on university and college campuses, on the door of a female, black female college professor at Columbia Teachers College in New York City. Do you see, but they're hanging everywhere. See, and I say that it's so important for us to think and analyze and think, because they kind of gave us a one-two punch. They had people thinking, it doesn't matter to call yourselves niggers. Oh, that's okay. Those are terms of endearment. And then let that music go into, because white young people were buying more of it than black people ever could. 
And so by the time we had exhausted ourselves with calling ourselves niggers and dogs, then they started hanging nooses, having trained us to demean and to degrade ourselves as though we had no value. And then they said, right, and we agree you have no value. So we're going to give the sign that it's okay to kill you. So I just say it's time for us to wake up. Time for us to wake up. Time for us to everybody get a PhD in black self-respect, black dignity, black self-respect. See, because I believe that that's more powerful than a nuclear weapon. See, if there are any veterans from Vietnam War, please understand what I'm saying. Little tiny brown people who were impoverished and they decided if every single one of us has to die, these white people are leaving. And guess what happened? The white people jumped up and ran. And they are still trying to understand why did they lose? Well, they had run into black, brown, self-respect. And I'll give you some other examples. When Minister Louis Farrakhan called the Midian Man March, and two million people came. <laughs> and stood in the most powerful country in the world. All of those powerful people ran away. They ran away. The young people who went to Jenna, the young people and the older people who went to Jenna, Louisiana, and all of us should give tribute to the people who went. The behavior was impeccable. The behavior was impeccable. And we need to look at those examples. Those people, the white people, ran out of Jenna. See, and I'm saying we need to follow it up with some more disciplined behavior. And what I'm suggesting if they don't fix this situation in Jenna by the end of October, there's going to be no turkeys that are bought. No Christmas trees. Do you all understand what I mean? Black people control nearly a $800 billion contribution to the economy. Do you see now, if I'm a bitch, and if I'm a whore, or you're a gangster and a thug, and somebody's a dog and a bow wow, the brain computer doesn't register self-respect. And I'm sure they thought that they had so effectively programmed us 
that they could do anything they want to us and we would just continue to shake booty and dance along as though nothing had happened. I do know one thing. The end of the year is the most important purchasing season in the entire year. Everybody is supposed to go crazy buying. You know, every year, my father was a physician in Chicago, and I grew up, I have two sisters, and we grew up. Every Christmas, my father would send Christmas cards to all of his patients. And we would be licking the envelopes and putting the stamps on, et cetera. And when I started my practice, I started sending Christmas cards every year or Kwanzaa, whatever. I'm breaking. Not buying any cars. <laughs> See, it would be nice, but I think, hey, we can make a statement. See, we can make a statement. <laughs> Start with the turkey. <laughs> Start with the turkey and the dressing. See, everybody plans for the holiday. I understand. I love dressing. Do you see? But it's like if we don't think that we are worthy of sacrificing in our interest. Dr. Martin Luther King said, if you haven't found that thing for which you are willing to give your life, your life is not worth living. See, and this is kind of just like a start. It's like first things no, black people are beginning to understand the local, national, global system of racism, white supremacy, whether consciously or subconsciously determined, that determines all patterns of perception, logic, thought, speech, action, and emotional response for the ultimate purpose of white genetic survival and to prevent white genetic annihilation. I've been waiting for 30 years for somebody to come up with a better definition. If they can, I'll throw mine out, but I haven't seen it. I haven't seen anybody's analysis that can explain all the ball games, explain why white people go ape over eating chocolate, and all the things that they enjoy drinking, like coffee, dark. Tea, dark. Coca-Cola, dark. Chocolate, dark. Subconsciously hoping that they can pour enough in and maybe they would get the color that counts. You see, now one of the things they did to us by teaching us that our color was ugly. And so as long as we were moving around thinking our color was ugly and that their color was absence of color, was what counted, then they could just strut around us and make us feel negative about ourselves and inferior. You just try holding your head up in liking black. See, now what do they put on when they want to look most sophisticated? The lady has to have a black dress, basic black dress. And when the man is highly dressed, he has to have on black tie and tails, long black thing hanging down behind him. Are you all with me? See, they are really wishing they were us 
but they taught us to hate ourselves. So I say to you, everybody needs to get the picture of the blackest, the blackest person, and I don't mean ugly, and put it in the center of their house. So every time they move down the hall or into another room, they're looking at black is beautiful. <laughs> to deprogram. See, we have to deprogram. Nobody needs to feel negative about their color. All the shades of black are okay. But see, white supremacy raped our grandparents and taught us to be glad that they were raped so we didn't look black. Are you all with me? See, we got to get next to and into. I don't know if you all get Joe Madison on Radio 1 here in Baltimore, but Joe Madison brought up this past week that there was a nightclub owner black in Detroit. Oh, yeah. And the poor brother just didn't understand. So he sponsored a night where only light-skinned people could come in free. Do you all understand? See, I mean, it's like they just steamrolled over our brains. And nobody needs to feel bad. It's like I tell the people in my office, don't call yourself a name. Just say that's fascinating. <laughs> See, the behavior, that's fascinating. That's interesting. See, then you can look at yourself with respect. You could want to change the behavior. But you are not name calling yourself. I'm stupid, I'm dumb, I'm, you know, no, don't name call yourself. You just say, that's interesting. That allows the brain to keep looking on it. And if it needs to be changed, it can be changed. So we've got color sickness. Read Randall Robinson's new book about Haiti. He's got a whole chapter in there about the whole color sickness in Haiti. But see, color sickness is all over the non-white world. In India, the people advertise in the newspaper want a light-skinned wife. It means they hate themselves. All over Asia, all over Africa, people of color are now going to the dermatologist because they've got chemicals that can take away the color. You see, everybody wants to be white. Well, let's say that I'm black and I want to be white and I look in the mirror and I hate myself. I'm upholding white supremacy. Somebody can say, well, maybe that's what happened to Clarence Thomas. <laughs> Might have happened to Condoleezza. <laughs> Might have happened to Colin Powell. Do you see where acceptance, acceptance by somebody white was more important than self-respect. So I say don't waste time knocking them because the white people reach into the box like reaching into a toolbox and picking up a tool meaning a non-white person oh I think I can use this no I can't it looks like I can't use this one let me put that back in the box and keep picking until I pick one oh I can use this one Looks like the self-respect level, self-respect IQ is low. Wants money more than self-respect. I can use that. Take that out of the box. Do you see what I'm saying? Neely Fuller says that <coughs> under white supremacy, we're tools. 
And they pick up a tool and use it until they don't want to use it anymore. And they just cast it aside. Do you see, but by understanding, understanding what the system is all about, then we can set long-range agendas for ourselves. Now, I'm going to give you all some recommendations. Don't throw anything at me. See, but they have made us weak as a people. Annihilated self-respect. See, there's an African proverb that says, where there is no shame, there can be no honor. Do you all understand? <coughs> Excuse me. So, number one on the agenda, master and understanding of racism, white supremacy. If you understand it as a system, the system, thank you, was designed for their genetic survival. The system was not designed for our maximal development of the black genetic and constitutional potential. And we keep waiting for the next election. thinking that somebody is going to come in and take care of us. Do you all understand? That's not what the system is about. See, just like we thought when we were formerly enslaved, that just take off the chains and we're sure everything is going to be okay from all that suffering that our ancestors endured. And they took off the chains and the next thing we knew they had put some laws in place to do what the chains did. And so we fought, struggled in the 60s, changed the laws. And we look up 50 years later and we're back at point start. Now what that tells us is that we're not dealing with just laws. We're not dealing with just chains. We're dealing with a total system that always sees that it is intact and that it is in place. And so all we need to do is step back and say, oh. And see, we greet each other by saying, what's happening? See, every time we see another person, hey, what's happening? Hope you know. Hey, what's happening? <laughs> see, we ask that question a thousand times a day. Something in the brain tells us because it's not flowing the way that it should flow. And I say we ask what's happening because we don't know what's going on. But I'm telling you what is going on is the system of racism, white supremacy. And they are going to keep their system intact by any means necessary. So here we are on the black side of the chessboard. See, if you were at a chess tournament, if you're playing football, you're playing basketball, can you ask the other team, help me win? Tell me what plays to make so I can put you in check or make you lose the tournament? No, you better go in that squad room and study those moves and those plays so you can come out with some tactics and strategy, strategy and tactic, and understand completely what the goal objective is. The goal objective for us as a people 
replace racism, white supremacy with justice on this planet. And see, just like in the 60s, when Stokely Carmichael said black power, the white reporters would come say, what do you all mean when you say black power? We didn't know. <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? In other words, just change these laws. We didn't understand then. It was a bigger system that we were dealing with. It's just like some people went to Jenna and said, it's the event, now what do we do? If we understood that was a move, that was an activity, but the long range goal is to replace the system of racism, white supremacy, with a system of justice on this planet. Someone told me that Gandhi, the Indian leader, was asked the question, what is the purpose of the Negro? And Gandhi said the purpose of the Negro is to bring justice to this planet. Now he must have gotten deep because I'm sure that the creator when the Creator made us the first people, the mothers and fathers of everybody on the planet, that the role of the parent is what? To straighten up the house. Straightening up the house, meaning the planet Earth house, is to see that justice prevails on this planet. And we need to see ourselves as the instrument, just like when you go in that courtroom and you see the judge in the black robe. He's supposed to be or she's supposed to be delivering justice. Many times they're confused because they have to bow to the system of racism, white supremacy. But as individual black people, Every black person is a leader. Every black person has to know what he or she is supposed to do on this planet, in this war, in bringing about justice on this planet. See, and I say justice flows from self-respect. It flows from self-respect. It's not something that somebody gives to somebody else. It flows from self-respect. So we have some serious work, everybody. We got some serious work and we have to break programming and previous training. What do I mean? If each one of us is to be a leader in this war, counter war, war is being waged against us, terrorism is being waged against us. See, when you have 50% of the men in a community unemployed, that's terrorism. And when you bring drugs and guns in, and say, now you can deal with this. This is going to be your job, and they have it all set up. Yeah, this is your job until I arrest you and put you in prison and have you working for slave labor. That's terrorism. Racism, white supremacy is the highest form of terrorism ever conceived on this planet. <laughs> And we need to recognize it and understand, so therefore, what are we going to do about it? Now somebody, well, you all don't have any big weapons. No, but we can build some self-respect. 
See, if we build self-respect, just keep in mind Vietnam, keep in mind the two million man march, keep in mind Jenna and impeccable behavior. We can frighten them to death just with impeccable behavior. See, if we're not clowning and cursing and name calling each other, and we're moving around with some quiet dignity, they might start having health care disparities. <laughs> see, they will be wondering what's happening. I see a young black man on his job. The white people say, How come your shoes are polished every day? Why do you wear a tie? How come you don't dress down on Friday? Meaning, I want to see you looking demeaned. Do you all understand? Have your pants hanging down. I just paid a black artist today. I may starve, but I paid this black man $2,000 for a painting of a young black man with his pants hanging down and all the other young peers around him holding boxes of tennis shoes or sneakers. A profound painting. I want it to go all around so people can see it. These young people worshiping sneakers. He said he was teaching school in Milwaukee, I believe, and a young man came to school and he had bags over his feet. And he was shuffling like this. And he said, son, why do you have the bags over your feet? He said, because I don't want anybody to touch my new sneakers. And later in the day, he said, the young man was in the hallway opening up the bags so that the other young people can look in. This picture was entitled, Children of the Doomed. See, we are doomed. Meaning they have, it's like somebody saying on the chessboard, checkmate. Or you lost the game, or you lost the tournament. See, now we may have to take 10 deep breaths to handle the reality. But they have smashed us. See, whoever can turn you into trash has defeated you. See, we all need to get a PhD in broom. That would psych them out. It's no trash around where black people live. They would be saying, wait a minute. We taught them to think of themselves as trash, and so they're not comfortable unless they're surrounded by trash. Who cleaned this up? Wait a minute, we got a problem. Do you understand? It's just like when black people were saying in the 60s, black pride, black power, black self-respect, black is beautiful. And they came along and they said, this is dangerous. If these people think they're beautiful, and if they're talking about pride and black self-respect, they're dangerous. Now we got to give them black exploitation film where they're selling drugs and the men are kicking the women and cursing the women and they're hitting and acting wild and crazy. We've got to get them back in a form that we can look at them 
and they may have skin color, but we'll have them in such a form that we can always look at them and feel superior because basically we feel inadequate. So it, our, it serves our psyche to see them in chaos. Now that's what we're dealing with. How are we going to change things? Hold on to your seats. Where does self-respect begin? See, I'm a general psychiatrist and child psychiatrist. Self-respect begins before the sperm meets the egg. Repeat after me. Self-respect begins, Self begins before the sperm meets the egg. Before the sperm meets the egg. Okay. Now you know how people used to call somebody or they were demeaning somebody and they would say bird brain? You know, bird has a little tiny brain. But the bird has enough sense to build a nest before it lays an egg. <laughs> See, now don't anybody feel bad. See, we didn't understand what was going on until we really get it in our brain computers. We are dealing with a total local, national, global system. And to the extent that it is about white genetic survival by any means necessary, it means that it is about our destruction, which is what all these nooses hanging up mean. So no, we were brought to this country enslaved African people to breed. Breed people that the slave masters could further demean and degrade. Breed. Studying and breeding. Now don't misunderstand me. Sex is magnificent. So what? See, nobody jumps out of a foxhole and starts talking about they got to get some. Do you all understand? See, because not having discipline, when they went in their laboratories to design HIV AIDS, as a matter of fact, one of the former secretaries of agriculture Maybe some of you are too young to remember. Butts was his name. Earl Butts. He said all black people want, he said this in public, all black people want is tight pussy, loose shoes, and a warm place to piss. Pardon the language. I mean, that's no different than Bill O'Reilly going to Sylvia's and saying, well, the people weren't hanging from the chandeliers. Right. Or Imus and his remarks. No, this is the way they discuss us because this is who they need us to be. Do you see, but breeding and studying, sex obsession. See, you can make a person sex obsessed. It's like you can make a person need alcohol and need drugs. Let me tell you how. Don't give little children all the emotional attention that they need. They will be 25 years old and still longing for it. I said they can be 25, they can be 40. <laughs> oh, 
A man sat in my office this week doing premarital counseling. These are middle-aged people. And the woman he's married has an older a grandmother that took care of her. And he was saying, I don't want her to bring the old person into our marital life. I want her all to myself. Do you see? And so very kindly, because I understood what that meant, and I said, you know, like, what do you think happened in childhood? You see, I want her all to myself. I mean, we could get witnesses. Sometimes men find themselves being jealous when a baby is nursing on the breast. He's not a dog. He just didn't get his lap time. See, slavery was not designed for us to get lap time. It wasn't designed for us to have family life. It was designed to have vulnerable people that you could make do your will. So don't anybody feel bad. We didn't design the system. But it's our responsibility to break it. See, so if I could wave a magic wand, don't anybody throw anything at me. See, I would say no sex until 30 and 35. Now I know, see I can read minds. <laughs> so I know they're, faces out here saying she's insane. <laughs> See, but we may be talking about different things. I'm talking about winning a war. I'm not talking about comfort. I'm not talking about having fun. I'm talking about building soldiers. Soldiers who don't need marijuana. Soldiers who don't need alcohol. Male and female soldiers. Soldiers who can withstand until the job is done. So that means that little children have to get their nurturance and they won't get it if somebody is 15 and 16 and feeling overwhelmed playing baby mama and baby daddy is not on the scene because he's overwhelmed. Do you all understand? I didn't say anything about bad people, stupid people, no. Sex obsessed because dependency needs were not met. Dependency deprivation. And so it's not just what the individual wants to do. We are fighting a war. And the other side is not going to help us. And another trick they did on us Hold your seats and don't get mad at me. They gave us a religion where God's son looks like the oppressor. So we spend our time, I told you all, I'm baptized Baptist, christened Methodist grandfather chairman of the deacon and trustee board at Olivet Baptist Church for 40 years in Sunday school every Sunday. 
But I came through that experience wondering, well, what's still wrong? Do you see, and when the slave master and the oppressor or the people who control white supremacy said, we will have them worshiping our image, the image of God in their minds is white. See, once I understood this, I realized when I was, you know, three or four years old, we had a pantry, and on the first big shelf in the pantry was a Quaker Oats box. Quaker? <laughs> and so I've been to Sunday school every Sunday from the time you could move on your own. And looking at the little Sunday school card, and they said, well, this is God's son. So I just was looking at that man on the Quaker Oats box, and I said, I guess, I said it to myself. I'm reasoning. <laughs> I said, well, that must be God. I mean, that's what I concluded, because then, you know, your grandmother, your mother, they would fix you some oatmeal and then have you say, thank God for it. <laughs> so I had the whole package. Go, go. See, and then I started thinking about some of the songs. Oh, precious, once you realize that Jesus was a black man, if he was over there in Palestine, he wasn't white. Billy Graham said he wasn't white. If you need some support. <laughs> You know that song, Oh Precious is the Flow, that keeps me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of the colored man. Think about that. His blood has to be flowing as it is in the streets of Baltimore and Washington and Chicago and Philadelphia, wherever they say the murder rate is through the roof. He has to be dead for there to be assurance of white genetic survival. Do you all understand? I'm saying all of this so that we really understand what we are dealing with. See, again, let me go back to my magic wand. 30 and 35. Married. No more than two, no closer together than three years apart so that everybody gets sufficient lap time so by the time they get to school, instead of saying, teacher, I can't. See, when little children are saying, I can't, they're not lazy, they're not stupid. They didn't get the security that they needed to feel that they can take those learning steps on their own. Do you all understand me? See, and I say the pants hanging down, I'm going to give it to you all real heavy. The pants hanging down is an invitation for a homosexual act. What does it mean? 
It means I want my daddy. Do you all understand? See, the gastrointestinal tract starts at the mouth and ends in the anus. In the hospital, as physicians, if people can't take medication, what the body needs by mouth, per os, it is administered in the rectum. So if the brain is thinking, I feel the need of masculine substance. The brain will go to penis in the mouth or penis in the anus. Because manliness has been extracted from the community. Now men don't take offense, please. I'm talking about what the war has done. See, why else? I mean, do you ever look at that? I used to say initially, the only persons who legitimately have their pants hanging down like that are an 18-month-old baby with a soiled diaper. Nobody to change the diaper. Do you see? But now, it has another level of significance. And see, it hit me that when the Panthers were destroyed, and Eldridge Cleaver left this country and was in France, do you know what he did? He became a fashion designer and designed pants with the penis, a cod sack, I don't know if that's what they call it, hanging on the outside. And I say that was a symbolic statement of go ahead and castrate me. Do you see, because you have destroyed us. See, it's just like when Nixon was impeached. See, if you train in psych child psychiatry, we're trained to go in a playroom and watch children when they're playing and what they pick up and what toys they pick up and translate the symbolism. And I'm sure that's what got me started. When Nixon was impeached, some symbolic behavior started on the part of white men. Do you remember what it was? They started running naked, streaking. See, now that's white body shame. They just automatically started taking off their clothes and running exposed because the white leader had been brought down. Do you see, so behavior symbolism, which is just like the ball games in the system of racism, white supremacy. For out of the white brain computer, see most people think, oh, ball games, that doesn't have anything to do with race.